Week two of, did you read the sermon title and start to sing? Oh, come on, you don't know it? Stand up. Stand up. This is active participation time. Come on, stand up. You know where we're going? Oh, I see somebody over here has got it now. You put your right hand in. Come on. You put your right hand in, you put your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey. Come on, people. That's what it's all about, right? All right, you can sense your party poopers, and you're not even going to hokey pokey with me here. Come on. Really? That's what it's all about, is what if the hokey pokey really was what it's all about, (laughs) right? That's a little scary actually, right? But think about it for a moment. In our lesson this morning, which is Jesus' prayer, which comes after a long time with the disciples. In the Gospel of John, there is no Lord teach us to pray and Jesus giving the Lord's prayer. That only happens in two of the Gospels actually. Not all four of them. But in John's gospel, this is after they had their last meal together. Jesus has washed the feet of the disciples. They've walked through the Kidron Valley, through the vineyards. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He's been teaching them all this time. And he gets to this point. And this is the prayer before he goes to get arrested in the gospel of John. And he did not go off by himself. The disciples are right there listening to every word that he's saying. This teaches us a few things about prayer. Number one, we don't have to do it by ourselves. Number two, you don't have to speak so people always understand you because did you understand everything? Jesus, I am in you and you are in me and they are in I and and we are all one and we're together. And it's, it's like Jesus is talking and we're not really sure what in the world he's saying here. So, but prayer is not something private and personal. Prayer can be open and communal and public. And Jesus here in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, I invite you to go home and read the whole thing. Because in it, he does pray for everybody. This first part, he prays for the disciples. The next part, he prays for those who are to come because of the hearing of those who he just prayed for. Which is? Us. Us. All of us. And then the last part of the chapter is Jesus praying for everybody in the whole world. For every person. But that's not what we're going to talk about this morning. Jesus said in verse 3 of the prayer that he said to the disciples this morning, and this is eternal life. How many of you have ever wondered what eternal life is? Don't let me remind you, you are in church, right? (laughs) We wonder about what eternal life is because we're promised that we have eternal life. But Jesus says very plainly here in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. Pretty simple, right? How many times have you heard somebody tell you that this is what eternal life is? Exactly. This is not the definition we hear of eternal life. This is not what we're told when someone tries to explain to us what it means to have life that is eternal. But what if it truly is that simple? If it truly is that simple that to have eternal life is simply to know God and to know Jesus Christ, how does that change life as we imagine it? Not only that eternal life, but life right here and right now? How would it affect the things that you do and the things that you say on a daily basis? How would it affect your thoughts about a future life with God? And how does this alter even our picture of who God actually is? But to actually understand this definition, you have to know what it means to know, right? I could ask each one of you, what it means to know, K-N-O-W, not N-O, but what does it mean to know? And I bet I'd get a lot of definitions. But the thing that we have to understand is 
what John, the writer of the fourth gospel, means by know. In the understanding in the gospel of John, to know is not anything that is a cognitive construction, which means it's something that we can know in our minds, we can understand, that we can have a conception of it and understand what it means. It's not anything that we do or say in a creedal consent means it doesn't, it's not thing to do with the Apostles Creed or the Nicene Creed. It's nothing to do with the things that we think we say that we believe. And it's not anything about any special or specified knowledge or understanding about who God is. In the Gospel of John, to know something or somebody goes back to the first biblical meaning of the word to know. Where Adam knew Eve. It's an intimate relationship. It's very relational. It means that you know God exists and that you are in a relationship with him. That's what it means to know God. And this is not merely an acquaintanceship or a friend on Facebook. It's an actual person or entity that you spend time with and you have a relationship with and it's something you work on. And to understand what that means, we have to understand what Jesus has as a relationship with God in the Gospel of John. So we need to look at the whole picture of the Gospel, at everything that Jesus did. So in chapter 2, of the, and this won't take that long, trust me, it'll be okay. In chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, Jesus goes to a party in Cana. Remember? Very first sign in the Gospel of John where Jesus changes water into wine. So Jesus is a man who likes to party and keep things going. You see, in Jesus' day, weddings lasted weeks, not just days. You didn't have a rehearsal and then a wedding the next day. Weddings lasted weeks. The celebrations lasted forever in Jesus' day. In, G in John chapter 3, Jesus talks to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who comes to him under the cover of darkness. Jesus is one who likes to spend time with us in our questions, understanding what we need to know. In chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. He goes to a place and meets people even when other people around them don't want to meet them or be with them. He goes to those who are the outcasts, to those who no one else will go to and spend time with or love. That's where Jesus goes. In the end of chapter 4, Jesus heals the official son, the second sign in the Gospel of John. Jesus cares for those who we don't think he should be caring for. And he does it from afar and near. In chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, from afar, he heals the centurion's son from where Jesus is. He says to him, let me come to you. And the centurion says, no, you just say that it be done and my son will be healed because that's how it works. And he healed the woman in Samaria at the well by being there with her when no one else would want to be there. In chapter five, he heals the invalid at the pool of Bethsaida. Even those who don't want to be made well or taken out of their status in life. Because Jesus had to ask this man, do you want to be made well? Right? It's not about the fact that we all want our lives to change. Sometimes we like being where we are. And Jesus is there to push us to say, no, you can't stay here. You need to come over here. Jesus pushes us out of our comfort zone. In chapter 6, he feeds the multitudes, saying, I am the bread of life. He feeds how many people with a minimal amount of food? Because he wants to make sure that our needs are provided for. In chapter 6, he walks on water. He comes to us even in the midst of our storms when we think that he can't get to us. In chapter 9, he heals the man born blind. The third, the fourth sign in the Gospel of John. Saying that I will help everyone see the things that they need to see. I will be there to open the eyes of the blind. To show you the things that you need to see. In chapter 10, he says that he is the gate for the sheep, the protector against the things that we think can hurt us. And he opens up the gate and lets in the things that sometimes we don't want him to let in. Because they're actually the things that we need. Right? 
He lets in what is going to be good for us in our lives. Not what we want, but what Jesus knows we need. He says a little later in the, God, in the 10th chapter that he is the good shepherd. He watches over us. He comes after us. He leaves those who are together and comes after the ones that are lost. And he leads us to do the things that we need to do. In chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead, proving that he is the life of the world, giving to us the things that we need. This sleep does not lead to death, right? This illness does not lead to death, he told his disciples. But yet Lazarus died so that Jesus could show everyone that everything that he said is true. In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He guides us to the places that we need to be. Our roadmap, our GPS, helping us to find our way. In chapter 15, the true vine, the one who keeps us connected to our true source of life. And Jesus even knows when we're going to fail. Chapter 18 where Peter denies Jesus three times and Jesus tells him beforehand that it's going to happen. Yes, Jesus knows when you're going to let him down. In chapter 19, he cares for the widow, right? Does anybody know what happened in chapter 19 with Jesus? Yes, he's hanging on the cross and the disciple that he loves is standing next to his mother and he says... Brother, here's your mother. Mother, here's your son. He died on the cross for each and every one of us. But while he was dying, he took care of the widow. In chapter 21, he brings us back. When I said just a few minutes ago and I left it hang there that he knows when you're going to let him down. He knows that. But he's going to bring you back just like he did Peter. Right? At the end of the Gospel of John, Peter is asked three times, do you love me? For each time that Peter denied him, Jesus came back and said, I know it was a mistake. It's okay. That's who Jesus is in the Gospel of John. Someone who goes to the person that no one else would go to and loves the people regardless of what they're going to do or say. And that's exactly the relationship that God has with each and every one of us. And to be perfectly honest, that's what it's all about. It doesn't have anything to do with the hokey pokey. It's all about eternal life and the fact that we already have it. Eternal life is not something that we're waiting for to happen. Eternal life is something that we are living in right here, right now, because God is already living with us and Jesus is surrounding us and the Holy Spirit is dwelling deep inside of us. And we already have that life and it's something that we are living in eternally. Yes, these physical bodies will die, but we will never be without God. Death is merely a step in the greatness of everything that is to come. So we need to live as Jesus lived, showing the people, the ones who no one else will go to, that no one else will love, exactly how much God loves them and how much they mean, not only to us, but to God. And that is truly, that is truly what it's all about.